Hello everyone, thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to introduce you to a guest, recognize, admire, and follow by many of you. Thank you, Kerry Cassidy. You have interviewed a multitude of individuals, Kerry. Nowadays, perhaps, it is the best time for a journalist, interviewer, or even whistleblower, no go to places one doesn't necessarily need to travel and spend a lot of money to reach places for an interview having the last technology, which is Zoom or any web cameras. What do you think about that? For those who don't know you, who is Kerry Cassidy? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, nice to see you. And just want to say that, um, you know, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now investigating and um, doing interviews uh, with people around the world, scientists, engineers, people mainly from what we call above black projects and investigating UFOs, ETs, um, and having whistleblowers for the last 20 years. And so it's, um, it's given me a great background to be able to evaluate what's going on now And I also have known and met several of the White Hats who are trying to take our country back for us at this time. Uh, so that also is wrapped into my work. So I also deal with the health issues, uh, politics, you, you name it. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty different, you know, than it used to be, of course. And we have AI and we have uh, some disclosure happening even on a... Um, sort of mainstream level and so there are um, more people ready to accept the secrecy and the secrets coming out and they're learning very quickly um, every day people are learning the secrets yeah so everyone is a truther everyone is when I started 20 years ago we were very unusual Um, so we were traveling the world interviewing whistleblowers and we were talking about all the things that people talk about now, but um, back then people didn't even know what a whistleblower was. <laughs> so it's very different in that way, in, in that people are, are getting up to speed much faster. And so for me, it actually takes a lot of um, the weight off my shoulders. It makes it easier for me that people like you and other broadcasters are out there um, putting out the truth and um, supporting really the, all the work I've done all these years. It's all coming out. It's all be pro being proven true. So um, people that used to hate me <laughs> have written me apology letters, <laughs> no, whatever, you know, and uh, because in the beginning, a lot of people didn't want to believe me. There's plenty of people still that don't want to believe me, but uh, more and more there are, uh, there is substantiation, you know, uh, out there. So, my work is being backed up and it, it's it's actually a great time for me um right now so I, i i i am much more happy now than i was back in the day because in the back when i was really working hard and we were touring touring the world um doing interviews it, i was It was very hard. I was on the road a lot and I was doing editing, video editing and all the tools that we use now. We didn't have all that. So it was much more difficult for me to, you know, even uploading a video took forever. It took like, I don't know, 45 minutes or something stupid. I mean, it, you know, I was a YouTube director in the very beginning. So I was different than most people in that way. I didn't make 10 minute videos. I made two hour interviews and I don't just ask superficial questions. And I also try to make sure that the person I interview is not lying to me i you know i um i i even interrupt them on purpose and if they start going down you know sort of this road where they're sort of sounding like um they're telling you know a lies or they're trying to basically be like a monotonous voice 
uh, repetitive or not following, you know, not intelligently, like their brain isn't hooked up to their mouth or something, it, the MK Ultra kind of thing. So I, you know, I, I've always done different kinds of interviews. I was trained as an actress in what's called the Sanford Meisner Acting School in New York City um, when I was quite young, in my 20s. And so I studied directing as well. So when I started doing interviews, I didn't even know what I was doing, really. But I had been a journalist already in college. And so I had a journalistic background. I didn't even put myself on camera originally. I only pointed the camera at the person. But um, there was a, a wonderful uh, broadcaster and his la his name is Jerry, and I think I'm forgetting his last name, but he's passed on. But he he wrote to me and he said, "Girl, you have to put yourself on camera." <laughs> and so I so I did. That's that's actually why I did it. Um, and you know, um, I think it was, it's a good thing to have the person who's doing the questions also on camera, so you can see their reaction. So I used my acting skills, my directing skills, to do that, to do a two camera shoot in the early days. And um, you know, it, it was hard. It was a lot of work because <laughs> I, I was the main person that knew um, cameras back then. My original partner, Bill Ryan, was very smart. He was a good writer, but he wasn't trained in, in cameras and acting and directing or anything like that. So I had to kind of run things, uh, you know, and, and educate him about that. Um, but we were a good team in the early days. And then we started to have disagreements about who we should interview and all that kind of thing. And so eventually we split up actually after about two and a half years. And so for the 20 years that I've been doing this, nearly 20 years now, um, I've been basically been on my own uh, doing everything. And I, I do have a, a a, a former partner who is a designer. So he makes me banners and he helps uh, with documentary footage. Like when we're, we shoot, when I lead tours in Egypt. Uh, so he, he, he really helps out in on um, live situations, but most everything is done online, as you know, right? So on zoom, like we're doing this now, and there's so many people doing this, right? <laughs> so I have tons of competition, which is probably good, you know, in a way it, it widens the playing field, gives people lots of different viewpoints. I'm amazed that people still want to hear my stuff. Um, but I learned so much over those 20 years that I, I have tons of things to say. So when people have me on their shows and ask me questions, I just have like a huge library of stuff that I have in my brain. So I kind of try to put things together in, in a way that makes sense. And also that, you know, I get down downloads, um, psychic downloads and stuff. So um, it's been an, a wild ride. I will say it's been a lot of fun. It's been probably one of the greatest um, ways to make a living, even though, I haven't had a lot of money. Like for many years, we didn't have a lot of money, but we asked for donations and everyone started sending donations, lots of money in donations because they loved what we were doing. So that was a great way to start. And then um, a few years ago during the COVID thing, I was banned on my, I had a huge YouTube channel, as you may know, that was like, um, I don't know, around three. 340,000 subscribers and 70 million views worldwide. Like that's almost as big as, or bigger than a television station, kind of like I'm just saying over the years, you know? And so I was a YouTube director and a, what you call a YouTube creator, but overnight they, they actually deleted my entire channel. So all that, those years of work, um, actually we saved it. You know, we had it on our website and we had it on, it went into odyssey.com, but uh, we've had all kinds of like, just recently I got my whole website rebuilt because they attacked me for the last six weeks because I did an interview about the Kennedy assassination. I know it sounds insane, but they kept taking me down every day. And all of my subscribers are really, they're getting mad at me because they can't log in and all this stuff. But I made 
a lot of videos free on Rumble and tons of videos Old videos are free as well on my website and on odyssey.com, as well as BitChute, which, you know, is an old platform that we used in the old days because um, back when YouTube would would try to stop you from having a certain video, right? Because they started out censoring people years ago, but during COVID, it got really bad. And that's when I had to, you know, I got banned and I had to start a subscription based just to stay alive. And um, so that's, you know, but I still have tons of free stuff. Basically, what you said, that's right. You know, now you said there's so many people doing videos about the same thing you're doing, but uh, no like Kerry Cassidy. <laughs> no like Kerry Cassidy, because that's quite okay. There's quantity, but uh, no quality. That's two different things. A thousand people passing by Kerry Cassidy channels. And I always say, why is she in the back? But uh, I realize that when you interview somebody, you don't want uh, people see you, you know, bother your hair or do things when I want to be concerned that people see my guess you know what i mean that's me i would do the question and i'm going in the back thank you well you know that i'm that's the way i am i was trying to do kind of psychological profiles at the same time as interview people so that people would get to know them that's why i did two hour interviews and and I really wanted to ask lots of questions like, you know, delving into the different areas that they talk about and not just let them come on my show and kind of bullshit or, or just tell stories or whatever. And, you know, some people were easier to deal with in that way than others. Um, but a lot of times, um, I don't know that now people say I have some special ability to get people to tell the truth. And so a lot of people are afraid <laughs> to come on my show and be interviewed because they're afraid they're going to violate their security oath or something like that. But I don't really do anything tricky. I just simply ask normal questions that anyone would want to know. And, um, you know, it's really up to the person. Sometimes they got you know, we get in a conversation like you and I were having a conversation and um, they get very comfortable with me. OK, so that's, you know, what would happen. Um, so then we're just talking like friends and they almost forget they have an audience. Right. Well, that's part of it, because when you forget you have an audience or you just feel comfortable with the audience, then you can speak freely. Right. And then you can really get good you know, information. Um, like one interview that um, interviewer out there, Tucker does a good job at that, like disarming the person, getting them to, you know, speak openly. Um, he laughs a lot. He acts, you know, like a normal kind of guy, right? And he, he's not trying to intimidate them or anything like that. So I, I you know, I often have... Um, one of the things about me is that I have a very open mind. So I will consider, you could say, well, I flew to the moon yesterday. And I would just say, really? Okay. Well, what was it like? And how did you do this? And, you know, or I would just be honest about it and just talk to them. I'm not going to say to them, oh, that's ridiculous or criticize them right off the bat. What I do is I use questions as a tool to reveal how truthful the person really is. And if they start going down a road and they can't answer my questions anymore, or they trip over themselves or whatever happens, right? Then what happens is my audience will write to me and say, I didn't trust that guy, you know, they like my questions or this or that, you know, that kind of thing. And or they'll write to me and say, I love that guy. They're wonderful. You know, you ask good questions and all that kind of thing. So it's it's like um, it's a double edged sword, as they say. Right. You can either have a very good rapport 
I mean, I did have a couple of people that um, got really upset at the questions I asked. Even one person, a scientist who I was asking questions, he he just uh, hung up on me <laughs> on the show. Uh, he got so ups upset, yeah, because um, he just didn't like that I was just asking him normal questions. I wasn't doing anything weird or anything, as far as I could tell. But um, um, but you know what happens is that a lot of times you'd be surprised. Even a person who was planning maybe to lie or not to tell the whole truth. When they get in a discussion, sometimes they, you know, if you ask a question the right way, then they um, they want to tell you. They they can't help it. You know, there is this thing about humans that I think that the what we say the the dark side knows, which is we love to talk to each other and tell each other the truth, the real truth, because that gives our lives meaning. And so the people that come on my show, they don't really come on my show to lie to me, most of them. This is what I think. I think that, that most of them come on my show because they really have something inside their heart that makes them, even when they've been in secret projects for 40 years, for example, they really all of a sudden think, here's an opportunity for me to tell people the truth. And they, they want to do it. They actually, it's it's them that wants to do it because, um, like I said, there's something inside of us. You can think think of it like this. You know, when you have a friend and then something happens to you and you go to your friend and you want to tell your friend the story, right? You want to tell them the true story. You don't want to just lie to them, right? Because they wouldn't be your friend otherwise. You want you want to tell them the real truth of what happened, and you want them to to like um, identify with you, be there with you, understand where you're coming from, right? And that is a connection, a human connection. So it's very natural. And um, it's only our society that tries to put things in obstacles in our way of that. But normally, you know, um, especially, you know, I just got used to doing that. I got used to just talking to people. I will talk to anybody about anything, <laughs> pretty much, you know. I mean... I, I don't I'm not, I don't like super detailed medical stuff. That's not my thing. But other than that, I, I'll talk about, you know, even during COVID, I had to learn all about that, which I hate. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like talking about medical stuff that much. But, you know, I investigated, I learned so much, right? And so it's just every subject I meet, you know, I, I come across. Also, I read books. A lot of people um, nowadays don't read books, right? A lot, a lot of them only lot watch of videos. A lot of people don't read books, Gary. A lot of people go to the website and they feel like, yeah. I don't know, I don't know, you had a sensation that when you, when you pick it up, a book, it feels so good. When you start reading, some people don't have that feeling anymore. I, I love to write and I love to read good writers. So I, you know, I enjoy that. And right now I'm reading all sorts of books. <laughs> um, it's fun. You know, um, I like watching movies and television as well. You know, good stuff. Um, I never watch commercials. I always turn the sound off on commercials because I think it's mind control. So I've been doing that for, I don't know, like, I don't know, my whole life, pretty much. Now, now that you went through the movies, which I like to watch movies, especially the science fiction movies. Yeah. I tell the people that are just watching because I know there's something, there's a code, there's a, something to inform and showing us the technology for a long time, you know, so many things that we have no idea that they are happening you know. you know see i worked in hollywood for 20 years before i started this job what i'm talking about <laughs> what I'm talking and about. and you know i one of the things i did was read scripts i was you know what you call it a reader a, a script reader and then you read it and then you recommend whether or not you think it should be made into a movie or television so i did that uh, for a couple different companies and um 
I did other jobs as well in production and, and various things. And I also wrote my own screenplays. So I, you know, I got really into Hollywood. I wanted to make mainstream sci-fi movies. That's actually what I wanted to do with my life. I wasn't planning to do this journalistic thing, but it came very natural to me to do the journalism. And I just, um, when I got out of Hollywood at a certain point, um, I couldn't, I reached what you call a glass ceiling. I couldn't get, it was like an old boys network and I was always a rebel. So I didn't get along with a lot of people at the top. Like they wouldn't let me be myself. I guess they didn't want to, whatever. And so I, I decided to, that's when I picked up a consumer grade camcorder and started doing Project Camelot. And that's how I met my first partner, Bill Ryan. I interviewed him you know, and we hit it off. And, and so then we decided to partner up because he was a good writer and a webmaster and I was a filmmaker and a writer. And so the two of us both wanted the same thing. We wanted disclosure, right? And this was way back in the day when even Stephen Greer wanted, was talking about doing disclosure and all that. Um, and so I was really into what's called guerrilla filmmaking right? So guerrilla filmmaking is based on the, I'll say MTV, if you remember MTV in the old days, it was about what's called guerrilla filmmaking. And that term, I grew up in college, I, we was, it was just known and I always wanted to be a guerrilla filmmaker. So then I started doing it. And I just bought this camera. And when I did interviews, I wasn't trying to make production value, perfect lighting, perfect, sound, all that kind of thing. What I just wanted to do was get a natural performance out of the guest, whoever they were. I wanted them just to feel comfortable and natural. And so that's what I was aiming for. And it was much more of a avant-garde back in the day. Now it's more common because we have all the tools that let us do this from our desktop, from our house. You know, you have a good Zoom or whatever, and you can basically take it pretty loosely you don't have to have everything you know super you know special or anything lighting you didn't you don't need a, a 10 person crew i mean in the early days i was very unusual because it was just me <laughs> first of all and um i did some interviews like that and then that then when bill my first partner joined me then I taught him how to use the camera so that I could also be seen on camera, but I would direct it. And that's how we started out was, was like that. So um, it was all about being natural. It was all about catching the guerrilla filmmaking, nothing fancy, whatever happened, happened. And um, some people criticized us even back then, you know, saying, oh, your sound's no good or your this is no good. But to me, it was all about the information, right? It was all about what the person had to say and people needed to hear it and they needed to hear it right away. I had sort of a point of view about that. Like I wanted people to find out the truth right away. I didn't want to wait Okay, so I didn't want to wait till everything looked pretty and perfect or anything like that. I just wanted more people to know what I knew about the truth about our universe, basically. And so I kind of was like, I felt like I was under a timeline, right, where I had to get it done and get it out there. And then when we started doing it, people were clamoring more for more and more they wanted us you know they wanted more videos all the time from us we could hardly keep up with the demand and um you know even now i i i, I do as many as i can but it's it's like such a lot of work i have <laughs> i have a lot of work now because i also write articles i'm trying i also do i do almost everything for my in my company right so I, I edit my videos, I upload my videos, I, I do the admin on my website. I don't create the website, but I have to post all the videos on my website and all social media. It's, it's like a big, you, you know how it is, right? You understand? So I'm busy all the time. People don't even understand well, how... 
It's not easy. I, I want to ask you a question right there where many people talking about manipulation, subliminal message, and codes in the movies. Putting truth in movies and television all the time, right? That's what I, that's what we I call that predictive programming. Okay, so they're telling you what they're going to do, just like, you know, The Simpsons is predicting things that are happening years later, right? So Hollywood is made up of, as you know, the Illuminati behind the scenes. All of those people, a lot of them, are part of the what we call the dark magicians, the, the Illuminati, and so on. And so they are educated in that way. Now, I studied the occult when I was quite young, um, super young, <laughs> because I just stumbled on some books that my mother had in our library. And she came from an Illuminati family. I don't even know where the books came from, really. I don't know if she read them or, or not, but I, I was a huge reader when I was a little kid. And so I wanted to know everything. I wanted to understand everything. And so that I was already investigating mysteries. Yeah. And I love mysteries, like any kind of mystery that I have to put, the, put two and two together and all of that. So Hollywood is, has been telling us the truth, but they put it in fiction. So, you know, so they say truth is stranger than fiction, right? And so that's what you see is that if you, they know that people realize that they're telling the truth. We humans have a natural ability to discern the truth. Like if I was to lie to you right now, you probably, you might smile and be nice about it and not tell me that I was lying, but you probably would feel it. You know what I mean? You'd feel it. And so I have that a lot, like when people, you know, I don't always call them on it. You know, I don't always say anything, but I know I can feel it. And um, humans do absolutely, you know, you can tell when your friends, when your family, when people are not, you know, telling the truth. So that is a great thing because we have that as part of our natural abilities and, um, Knowing the truth about our world right now could save our lives, right? Because it's very dangerous, the world right now. And if you don't know what's really going on, you, you know, they can kill you. They can, you know, track you down. And if you don't know you're being followed or if you don't know they're listening. I mean, I go to restaurants, okay? And with, I, sometimes I go alone, but most when I go with someone and we're having a conversation and a, a single guy will sit right next to our table all of a sudden, right? In a whole restaurant where there's no single guys, most single guys don't even go out to eat alone in case you haven't looked at restaurants lately. But it's when they would be seated right next to me, I know they're there to spy on me to listen. Okay. I, I just have this sixth sense. And plus it's pretty obvious, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying you have to have your wits about you. You always have to, in my line of work, you know, because I've been followed. I've been super listened to even back in the day when they didn't do as much surveillance as they do now, but now everyone's surveilled. So, you know, it's not so unusual, but I still get some special treatment, I guess you might say, in that regard. Wow. Oh. How did your experience with extraterrestrial begin? And how would you describe them? Um, but when I was a little kid, I already knew there was secret being there were beings and I, I saw ghosts and I could see, you know, I got information. And I was being abducted also when I was um younger than 12 I forget exactly when but I would have strange you know dreams and things and um, then I started reading about it later and you know I saw these movies like um, you know Spielberg and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and E.T. and and various other movies right and then you just realize that you're not the only one that is aware that there are other dimensions and other beings and plus i've always been very interested in any kind of secrecy any kind of 
even spiritual secrecy, right? So I, I was very spiritual. I studied, I was more spiritual than I was scientific, let's say, when I was younger. So um, I, I learned how to study science and all of that. But one time they gave me, you know, they give you IQ tests in, in college and, and whatever in high school. So I would score really high in art and really high in science. So somehow part of me, even though I didn't think I was a science person, I have an ability to understand science if somebody talks to me about it. You know, like I have lots of my, um, I talk to a lot of scientists. So it's a good thing that I have sort of a natural ability in that area. But mainly I was more on the artistic side and spiritual side. That's what really interested me in the early days. But now all through my life, I've, I've gained quite a bit of scientific knowledge as well. Uh, it, I mean, we are all telepathic, so it's very possible I mean, you know, you and I uh, connected last week. And so, yeah, I mean, it's very possible. Um, you know, one thing I would have is uh, even before I interview somebody, sometimes I would have dreams about them. And I would have dreams about the interview. Information would come to me, you know, even during the interview, information came to me, right? And I actually think that I was being helped by ETs and hidden hidden beings in my interviews i really do and i could sometimes i could see beings pass in front of the camera because I, I have a certain kind of it's called etheric sight where you can see you know shimmering imagery and stuff like that you, you can if you meditate a lot you develop what's called through the third eye you develop a certain amount of uh, uh you know etheric sight so i can see things that are other people maybe ne don't necessarily i can sense things that are there and stuff like that so and i've had some you know weird kind of things happen like that in my life so i i was not closed-minded about aliens ever in my whole life i was always open to that i was always aware of other other worlds beyond this one that that's just the way I was I wasn't you know I, I wasn't taught to be like that um I used to joke with my mother about this and she would say oh no Carrie that's not true this or that and I would laugh at her and I just say no you're wrong <laughs> you know and this is when I was a kid I was just you know I just knew stuff and uh, what can I say? You know, it's just one of those things. I think there are a lot of kids out there. They know stuff. And so I, I love kids. And I think that people should pay attention to them more and listen to what they have to say. Because I think they, they're really smart, you know, and they've got a lot to, to contribute to our society. Gary, what do you think about the underground cities and the experiences of this individuals being taken? Well, this is what we learn uh, from whistleblowers that there are whole cities underground and there are tons of underground bases all around the world, um, not just in America, but there are maps now that you can actually go online and, and see maps of America, for example, and all the underground bases are marked. And um, you know, you, you won't be able to see all the different levels because they usually, the elevators go really far down. Um, and then there's the ones that are already there, the alien bases like the reptilians and the greys and all of that. And they're also in the ocean. So I can sense when I'm in a place where there's a base and where there's um, like ETs. Like we went to... Um, to speak at a conference in Vilcabamba in Ecuador. And, uh, and, and in the mountain right there is an ET base, a gray ET base. And I knew immediately. How many, how many years ago? Here. This is like, I don't know, more than 10 years ago. You know, like my, I don't know, around 2010 or so. So that's more than, it's 2024. It's, it's almost 14 years ago. 
whatever. But anyway, I just, you know, I, even now, um, I can tell you things about, you know, like I know that Mount Shasta had, I, when I went there, I was going to speak at a conference with Sean David Martin. He invited me. This is over 10, this is 2010. And I just went there. I thought it was going to be so beautiful, you know, Mount Shasta, and it was going to be a forest, and I was going to stay in a cabin. I was all excited. And I arrived, and I couldn't believe it because there was an overlay on the forest even where I saw that the reptilians had come in and invaded and that the trees were dying and the place was not the way it was supposed to be. And I went into the cabin where I was staying and I was, you know, going to go to dinner, right. You know, a little later, but I suddenly started getting downloads and a communication from what are called the Telos people. And I got their name and I got that they were in a very bad way in the, in Mount Shasta and that they were communicating to me how they'd been taken over by the reptilians and how they were really in distress. And I mean, I felt so sad. And so, you know, like, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Um, I think it might have improved since then. This is like I say, back in 2010. But after that, I warned people about that area, you know, because um, it, it was totally infiltrated by the reptilians. And these uh, people, these beings that live in the mountain called Telos, um, and there are probably other beings that live there as well. But I, I communicated with this particular group and, um, you know, th they, they just communicated with it's weird. And I even got their emotions, you know, and all of that. So it, you know, I have some weird things that happen to me, like, especially when I go somewhere, like away from where I live, I'll often have information come to me. And um, I'm very um, also sensitive to other cultures. I love other cultures, but I also, I'm very sensitive to native Americans, for example, and I've had um, a lot of stuff with that. And um, my father was um, really identified with the Native Americans and taught us all about them when we were kids. And um, now I actually, I, you know, he might have been part Native American because he sort of looked a little like it. And um, my other sister looks like it, more like Native American. I still have some of that, but my other sister has, one of my sisters has a lot of it and she's an artist and she would just draw Native Americans all the time. I'm sorry. I cut you when you were talking about Ecuador, the country, Ecuador. Oh, well, that was just, that was the mountain. So we went to interview Brian O'Leary and speak at his conference. And I, um, there's a, a woman who, um, I'm not going to say her name, but she had a house in that area and she actually put a model of a UFO on top of her house. And with, there's a lot of, you know, people that are aware in the Vilcabamba, Ecuador area of lots of flyovers, you know, lots of interaction with the ETs and stuff. And um, I just, I got it immediately. And I didn't really like it, to be honest. I, I, I don't like gray bases. I'm, I, you know, a lot of times I really won't like it. Um, but, you know, you have to deal with them. I also went to Norway and I also spent the entire night at a hotel interacting with these little tiny ET type beings. And I thought they were so stupid and they kept, trying to mess with me and I kept, you know, laughing at them and telling them they were too stupid and all of this kind of thing the whole night. And in the morning I woke up and I told my partner, Bill, we're going to leave right now. We're getting out of here. And we left like at six in the morning <laughs> from this hotel because I, I just knew that, you know, they were just trying to mess with us. I think that people would like to know how they, reptilians and those little ones they looked like um well there's pictures all over the place on the internet you know they're pretty accurate um you know there are small ones um 
also in one of my videos, you know, I was talking to um, John Edmonds. I don't know if you remember this video or if you if you saw it. Um, and he has uh, had a ranch in Arizona, and it was very near what's called Tonopah. And there's an alien base underneath there. It was it's actually a combination alien human. And he was always having aliens show up in his house and all this stuff. So when he was talking to me on the video, do you see how you see like behind me, you see my thing? Well, he, what he had was a, a kitchen, like a, with a, you know, sort of a, it went back and you could see the wall. And what happened was there was two ETs, sort of a taller one and a shorter one. And they peeked around the corner on the video, like, like I'm talking to you, it was on a live video webcam. And I, and I caught it and, and my audience caught it as well. And so then we, you know, they did a slow motion and they, they zoomed in and a television show actually bought some of my footage of that, <laughs> but it was real. I mean, they were now, I don't know if they were holograms or real ETs. I don't know if the secret space program was messing with us or what, but they, you know, they really look like little ETs and, um, it's on film. You can see it. I still have it on my channel. I think it's on my Odyssey channel. I think that's where it is. Is everybody under a program, under mind control program? Um, well, think about it this way. Our religion, our education system, you know, the Jesuits, you know, the, well, the Catholic Church is, is run by the reptilians underneath the Catholic Church in Italy, you know, the, the Vatican. So what the Jesuits do, they send around um, all the Jesuits to the churches around the world. And they were actually known to be like a spy network where they would spy on people and they would also be in a church, right? And watch people and teach people certain things and whatnot. So they have a network of spies in essence and you wonder why everyone might be programmed or kind of MK Ultra programmed or whatever. It's because they have already been watched and this, you know, basically influenced by these beings that are in working in cahoots with the various ET races. So, you know, good. Now there are some good ETs as well. So, you know, that's important. <laughs> And um, it's not just me. It's also all my witnesses. I have tons and tons of people that came to me to tell me their stories. So, you know, they, they can't all be wrong and they can't all be crazy, you know, in the end of the day. And plus, I have my own stories, right? So it made me more open-minded, I guess you might say. What is your, what is your opinion about leaving this war and going to other worlds? Do you believe in reincarnation? How do you see this concept of heaven and hell? I don't see it as hell. I think it can be hell. You know, I think that we're souls. You know, we, we tend to identify, say, our whole life is our body, right? But the reality is that we are not our body. And we are, we exist far, you know, we, we leave our body, we come back every night when we go to sleep. You know, it's a vehicle. We use this vehicle. We occupy it. And we will always continue because we are spirit and soul and connected to source, God, the creator, whatever you want to call it. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, we don't die. It's not real. And we do have multiple incarnations and even simultaneous um, And this goes back to the work of Ashiana Dean and the Voyager books. And they're linked on the front page of my website if you're interested. Very deep, very excellent information that she downloaded from what are called the guardian races who have been protecting humanity on the good side of things. And um, so there's a lot of truth in those books. I, I found that it resonated with me very very much and that's why i interviewed her it was like a six hour interview <laughs> it was really long 
And, um, you know, I stayed in touch with her over the years. I even traveled with her to India with her group and um, had some amazing experiences there and stuff like that. So I, I think that, um, you know, that everyone may be programmed, some people more than others. Like, it's kind of weird, but, you know, when I was a kid, I questioned everything and I liked mysteries and I... I didn't just like, you couldn't just tell me some story or something like that. And I would want to know more and I would want to investigate and all of this kind of thing. Um, it's, it's just the nature of the way I was when I was born. I don't know, but a lot of, there are a lot of people who like to take orders. I never was, you know, obedient. I never liked to take orders. That was one thing about my personality. <laughs> And I, I actually got in trouble in school when I was a kid. I, I would talk back to the teachers. I, now when I look back at myself, I kind of laugh because I, I can't believe that I did some of the things that I did. But I was, you know, I was not going to just listen to somebody tell me something and, and, and just nod my head and, and go along with it. I don't know why I was just so rebellious, but I always was and I still am. So <laughs> I just... I mean, I, there was a guy that um, called from England who was a fan of mine who wanted to teach me how to have offshore um, money and all this kind of thing, right? And I started, I would just ask him questions, right? Like I thought it was just normal. Pretty soon he said, I can't, I'm not going to talk to you anymore because you asked too many questions. <laughs> but it's just, you know, that's kind of the way I am. I don't. I never, I never liked the monetary system. It never made sense to me. Um, you know, I just thought it was stupid and, you know, I could tell that it was completely controlled. I mean, there's, see, these things are obvious to me. I don't think they're a big revelation, but um, I've tried to learn like, you know, what people believe in, in these ways. Right. And I've tried to kind of. What about all of this that has been announced? with a fall of the cabal in a blackout that's coming, but hasn't appeared with this monetary collapse in endless things, say, that happened in 2024 elections? Uh, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that we have to fight back. We have to fight back and we have to keep doing what we're doing, which is, you know, that's why truth has come to the planet, that that that's a change over the eons, right? That humanity is rebelling. You know, that's why I wrote my book, which is right behind me. It's, it's you can't see it so great. You can't see the title, but it's Rebel Gene. I named it Rebel Gene because it's all based on, gen, you know, our genetics. It's built into our DNA that we will be rebels, and some of us are following orders and, you know, those kind of people, right? They have to learn to be rebels. They are not naturally rebels. You know, whereas I was growing, I, I was born like that, I said, you know, but so that I wrote a book about it. Um, and I just think that, you know, every human has to question everything. And that's the only way we're going to have a better life for people, right? Because there's so much. Um, inequality on the planet and so, so much um, dreadful stuff going on. People trying to own other people, you know, torture other people, torture children, the whole adrenochrome highway, you know, with, that's what I call it, the adrenochrome highway. And, um, you know, all this craziness, it's, you know, it's become an epidemic, actually, child trafficking, human trafficking, and aliens Reptilian aliens and greys traffic humans as well. So they basically are taking us off planet. They're taking people off planet. And they're also, you know, doing horrible things to them and killing children and, and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, when you learn about that, you can't just sit in your house and just do nothing. I mean, you have to do something, right? I'm doing my best to wake people up even if they don't do that, right? And I think a lot of people are. I think it's really good that we are doing the, 
you know, a lot of that work. I wish the White Hats would do the EBS right now. I'm sick of waiting. We're all sick of waiting. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's supposed to all happen this year in 2024. I'm not, you know, if, if they don't, you know, do this stuff this year, forget it. It's like they're not sticking to their word. They're not being honest. Um, so they need to step up. They need to do these things this year. And Trump, of course, we believe firmly he will win the election. He will be back in office in 2025. And he's already secretly the president and the commander in chief, as you may know. And even, you know, Putin knows it. All of the world leaders know it. The only people that don't know it are some Democrats in the United States who are blind. And that's a problem. <laughs> Cassidy, I think that's enough because she, I want to invite her again. <laughs> I want okay. to invite her Cassidy because there's so many, so many topics. She's been living so many situations, so many people she interviews. So I just want to stop here and invite her back and say thank you so much thank you gary cassidy for coming to my channel um well go to my website you know which is project camelot portal.com and uh you can also go to my telegram i post on telegram every day so if i have a news i find i go out and find the news and then i make comments Sometimes I even go on there at three in the morning and start ranting. <laughs> and, you know, I also have a new thing called Substack, uh, which I call News and Views, which I've also been doing since they kept attacking my website. So now I also started another thing, which is the Substack. So that's, you know, under my name, Carrie Cassidy. And um, all my links are on my, my website. My website just got rebuilt, so it's actually working now. It's great. And the, the um, admin who I hired to do this is doing a great job. I'm very happy. And um, so what else can I tell you? There's, you know, I have a Rumble, Project Camelot Rumble, Project Camelot on Odyssey, Project Camelot on BitChute. I also have a YouTube channel that I started up again it's very small but you know i'm putting some videos over there because that now they stopped um censoring me as much but any day tomorrow or the next day they could censor me again so i don't depend on them but it's just you know i try to use all the social media i'm on truth social i'm on twitter i'm on uh, instagram i'm you know i'm i'm on lots of stuff facebook of course i have two facebook pages one is my name Carrie Lynn Cassidy, and one is Project Camelot. Thank you, Nikki, for the interview, and you're very charming. Thank you. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Carrie Cassidy. Sincerely, I would like to invite you back to my channel anytime. <laughs>